Hi everyone, this is Miss Lassar again, and today I'm going to be teaching you about cellular respiration. Today's table of contents, we're going to start with answering the question, why do we eat food? Then we'll talk about the purpose of cellular respiration, and finally the process of cellular respiration. One really important note, make sure that you're taking really good, really thorough, detailed notes in whatever way your teacher told you to take notes. The content of this lecture is really important. All of the text that you see appear on the screen is probably a good idea to write down. You want to make sure your notes are like your own personal encyclopedia, that they have all of the details that you could possibly need to understand this concept. More detail is better than less detail. So if in doubt, write it down. And let's start with actually a recap of what you just finished learning about, photosynthesis. This should be familiar. Here's our overview of photosynthesis, the chemical reaction of photosynthesis. We've got our reactants or starting materials on the left, our products or what we make on the right. And you all know that for photosynthesis, we start with six carbon dioxide molecules, plus six water molecules, plus light energy. We rearrange those atoms into one glucose molecule and six oxygen molecules. And where does the light energy go? It goes into the bonds of the glucose molecule. So if you don't have this precise equation written down in your notes from last week, take a moment, write it down. For example, if you wrote down C6H12O6, but you didn't label that glucose, write it down now. Make sure you've got a good, complete chemical reaction equation in your notes. And we talked about the purpose of photosynthesis. We said the point of photosynthesis is making this glucose. This oxygen, it is an unwanted byproduct. The plant just gets rid of it. So what's the purpose of this glucose? Well, this should be familiar too. This is how we ended the lecture. We said some of the glucose gets used as food. It gets broken apart and the energy is used to fuel all of the processes in the cell. Some of the glucose is used as building materials. It's used as a monomer to build complex polysaccharides like cellulose for structural support or starch for long-term energy storage. Again, this is a really important slide. So if you didn't have these details in your notes from last week, just take a moment, add these to your notes now. And now we're ready to start the new content. We're going to be focusing on this, the glucose that gets used as food. So here's our first big question. Why do we need food? Well, all organisms need food. Plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, we all need food. Some organisms can make their own food. These are called autotrophs. And this is what you just learned about. Autotrophs, plants, make their own food during photosynthesis. Their food is glucose. So autotrophs is a category that includes plants like the banana tree, the fern, and algae, like this kelp that you see growing underwater. Pretty cool. Plants can do photosynthesis underwater. They still get access to carbon dioxide, to water, and to sunlight that can filter through the water. On the other hand, there's another category of organisms that includes us. We can't make our own food. We can't make glucose in our body. We don't do photosynthesis. We have to eat our food. We're part of a category called heterotrophs. Heterotrophs are organisms that need to consume their food. This includes humans, we eat pizza, and all other animals, like you can see this bird eating a cricket. It also includes fungi. So you can see these mushrooms are actually eating this dead tree. Fungi, mushrooms, do not have mouths, but they're still able to eat the tissues of this dead tree and use those tissues as their food. So why do we need food? Well, if you're an autotroph, that food goes in one of two places. About 10% of the food that autotrophs make is stored in the plant. It's used to build new cells in the plant, and it adds to the mass of the plant. That food stays in the body of the plant. However, about 90% is broken down to release the chemical energy that's stored in the bonds of the glucose. That stuff that's broken down doesn't stay in the plant. It actually gets released back to the environment. So those atoms, they're not staying in the plant. They don't add to the mass of the plant. They're just being used for the energy that they're storing. Take a moment, record these details. 
And what about heterotrophs? Well, heterotrophs have a slightly different breakdown. About 10% of the food that heterotrophs eat is stored in the organism, used to build new cells, and adds to the mass of the animal. But about 30% of the food that or that heterotrophs eat is lost as waste before it can be broken down or used. Think feces. About 30% of the food you eat just passes right through you and doesn't actually move from your gastrointestinal tract into your body. It just passes through you. But about 60% of the food that you eat is broken down to release the chemical energy stored in the bonds of the glucose. And again, just like in the plants, the stuff that's broken down, it doesn't stay in you either. It's released back into the environment. So same deal, about 90% is released back into the environment either as feces or as broken down parts of glucose. And we'll talk about that a little more later. So when we talk about food, sometimes we say like food is energy, but the thing is food is not usable energy yet. Food stores a lot of chemical energy. You learned this last week, but cells can't use that energy directly. They use a very particular type of chemical energy. Almost all cellular processes need the chemical energy to be stored in a specific molecule, ATP. I have a little diagram here of ATP. It is this funky shape consisting of this um, unusual geometric shape and three circles. It stands for adenosine triphosphate, and I'll tell you more about it in a moment. Cellular respiration is just the process of transferring chemical energy from food molecules into chemical energy stored in ATP molecules. Let's talk more about ATP. So you can kind of learn all you need to know from just these two pictures right here. We've got two different molecules on the screen. This one's labeled ADP, uncharged molecule. You can see it's made of a nucleotide and two phosphates. Those are the blue circles. And our little battery is showing us this is not a charged up molecule. But then we've got ATP, and the only difference is that it's got a third phosphate on the end. So same nucleotide plus three phosphates, and it says charged molecule. And you can kind of see this little yellow bond back down here at the end. This is our like energy filled bond right here. So ATP, like we said, holds chemical energy that fuels almost all cell processes and therefore all of life. ATP, like you saw before, stands for adenosine triphosphate. So if you haven't figured it out yet, this red shape, this is adenosine. These blue shapes, these are phosphates. Tri means three, so this is adenosine plus three phosphates. ADP, what could that stand for? Well, there's only two phosphates here. What could D stand for? Di, a prefix that means two. So this is adenosine diphosphate. And as you can see from these two pictures, adenosine is charged with chemical energy by adding another phosphate to create ATP. So to charge up ATP, like charging up a battery, all we need to do is add another phosphate onto the end of ADP. And then it becomes ATP and it's fully charged. Some examples of ATP powered processes, because I said basically everything is an ATP powered process. Here's some good examples. Contracting a muscle cell. All of your movements come down to different muscles contracting. And that contraction is actually myosin and actin fibers uh, contracting together. And that whole process is fueled by ATP. Sending electrical messages through the brain, all of those electrical messages are initially triggered by, you guessed it, some ATP. What about repairing DNA? You damage your DNA all the time and it's really bad. Uh, if you get an x-ray, if you're out in the sun for too long and you get a sunburn, you've probably damaged some DNA and your body is constantly trying to repair that. All of that DNA repair to keep your DNA intact is fueled by ATP. Take a moment, write down these examples. Pause the video if you need to. So one more time before we talk about the process, 
The purpose of cellular respiration is the process of transferring chemical energy from food molecules into chemical energy in ATP molecules. Okay, so that's the whole purpose. We got to transfer our energy from our food into our ATP. How do we do that? It's time to talk about the process. Let's start by writing down our cellular respiration overview, just like we did for photosynthesis. We'll start with our reactants on the left, our products on the right. Make sure you label your paper, set up the reactant side and the product side. And our reactants or starting materials include one C6H12O6, that's one glucose molecule, plus six O2 or six oxygen molecules, plus some ADP. Okay, so when you're writing this down, make sure that you're writing down this chemical formula and underneath it labeling that this is a glucose molecule. You're writing down this chemical formula and labeling it six oxygen molecules. Be thorough. So these molecules are rearranged into our products. Six CO2 or six carbon dioxide molecules plus six H2O, six water molecules, plus ATP. This is our end goal. This is the good stuff right here. And just like in our photosynthesis overview, let's record the energy transfer as well. In cellular respiration, as we said, chemical energy in the bonds of the glucose molecule is transferred into chemical energy in the bonds of the ATP molecule. Take a moment, get all of the detail from this slide recorded. So now let's talk through the cellular respiration steps. And this is really another part of the video where I'm going to ask you to record all of this text, even if it feels long, because it's going to help you understand this concept better. And you want your notes to be an encyclopedia. Feel free to shorten, feel free to paraphrase, but make sure you get all of these details. So let's start with step one. Step one, all food molecules must be broken down and rearranged into glucose. Here I've got a polysaccharide. You can actually see all of the glucoses that are bonded together here. Our first step is let's break them down. Let's break down our giant polysaccharide into five separate smaller glucose monomers. In animals, the food, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids are digested and broken down into glucose in the small intestine and liver. And that's something that we're going to learn more about next semester when we study human body systems. In plants, the stored cellulose or starch is broken down into glucose. Where is there stored cellulose or starch? In the sugar sinks. Throwback to our plant structures week. For example, I've got a picture of a carrot on the screen. A carrot is filled with starch. And when the rest of the plant needs some energy to grow, uh, that starch that's stored in the carrot could be broken down into glucose. And that glucose could fuel, could be used to create ATP and fuel some cell processes. Step two. Glucose is moved into the cell. I've got an animal cell here and a plant cell here. Let's move glucose into both of them. And by the way, you might be asking yourself like, uh, which animal cell in my cheek, in my liver, in my brain, where are we talking? It's all cells, all living cells, all of them, everywhere. They all do cellular respiration. They all constantly have to charge up those batteries. In fact, if any cells ever stop doing cellular respiration, they will die pretty soon after. So all cells do cellular respiration, all plants, all animals, all bacteria, all fungi. In animals, how do we get glucose into animal cells? Well, glucose moves from the GI or gastrointestinal tract through the blood to all body cells. We've got our food in our gastrointestinal tract and our small intestine. We break it down into glucose. We move it through the blood to all of the different cells in our body. In plants, you just learned this, how does glucose move? Through the phloem. Glucose is moved through the phloem to all body cells. And we might be moving our glucose from the leaves to the stem. We might be moving it from a sugar sink like the roots to a place that's low on sugar. All we know is we're moving it through the phloem. Okay, we've moved our glucose into the cell. Step three. 
oxygen is moved into the cell. There it goes. In animals, oxygen enters through the respiratory system, you breathe in, and moves through the circulatory system, the blood, to all of your cells. In plants, oxygen enters through stomata all over the plant, especially at the roots, and diffuses straight into plant cells. Isn't that interesting? There's not just stomata on leaves. There's also stomata on many other plant structures, including the roots. A lot of oxygen enters plant cells at the roots. Step four, glucose and oxygen are both moved into the mitochondria. And I've got a little mitochondria here. They're bean-shaped. They're very cute. You probably are familiar with mitochondria as being called the powerhouse of the cell. And if you're not familiar, the mitochondria is an organelle in plant and animal cells where cellular respiration takes place. So let's zoom in to the mitochondria. Okay, here we are. We're inside the mitochondria. I know it's not bean shaped anymore, but I had to fit it on the screen. We are inside the powerhouse of the cell. We've got our glucose and our six oxygen. Remember, that's what we started with. And our ADP. I've also got some phosphate groups here. Step five has three parts. <laughs> so step five, enzymes in the mitochondria, A, break the chemical bonds of the glucose and oxygen. So these molecules get separated into atoms. B, use the chemical energy that was released to turn ADP into ATP. And C, Rearrange the atoms of the glucose and oxygen into carbon dioxide and water. And all that is happening in the mitochondria. Step six, the carbon dioxide and water are waste and leave the organism. In animals, the carbon dioxide and water will leave through the respiratory tract. You will breathe them out. In plants, they will exit through the stomata. Finally, last step, step seven, the organism will use the ATP to fuel cellular processes and the ATP will be transformed back into ADP. So we'll need more glucose and oxygen to recharge that ADP into ATP. Cellular respiration never ends. Okay, so here's what I mean. We just made some ATP. We contract our muscles. And in doing that, we break our ATP back down into ADP because we transfer this chemical energy into mechanical energy. And that mechanical energy will probably be lost um, to the atmosphere as thermal energy or heat. So now these aren't charged up anymore and they're just separated, sad little uncharged ADP molecules. And we've got to charge them back up again and start that whole process over. So one more time, here's our cellular respiration overview. We need glucose and oxygen and ADP. And when we combine these ingredients in the mitochondria, they're rearranged into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. And our energy transfer is chemical energy from the bonds of the glucose molecule is transferred into chemical energy in the bonds of the ATP molecule. And that's the process of cellular respiration. We'll talk more in class and later next week about how important this process is. And you'll think more about how this process determines things about your own life besides just keeping you alive. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure you've got really solid, really detailed notes. Rewind and rewatch any part of the video that you need to. And we'll see you all in class. Bye, people.